Hi, this is Governor Pete Ricketts, and welcome to another edition of the Nebraska Way, where it's all about how Nebraska is growing and more. And once again, we have a great guest. We've got Jane Miller, who is the retired now, right? Yes. President and COO of Gallup, yes. which is an organization that focuses on how to develop your people, make your organization more effective. Of course, everybody's probably heard of the Gallup polling thing as well. But you are a native of Nebraska and have, uh, you know, grow up here. You went to the University in Nebraska, right, where you got your bachelor's degree. Um, you've got uh, a daughter, right? A daughter, yes. Right? So uh -huh. that's great. But really, your career has been with Gallup, focusing on how to, to grow organizations and, and been involved with that. And then, of course, um, and we're going to talk a lot about that, but we're all, but also you've been very involved in the community as well, right? You've been um, part of the Peter, Peter Kiewit Foundation. You're also currently on the Luminarium. Correct. Board. Did I say yes, that properly? You did. Luminarium, yes. Luminarium. Uh -huh. well, I expect that we talk about that later yes, as well. Yes, absolutely. So, uh, uh, so we'll find out what that is. Okay. But you've also been the Omaha on the Omaha Zoological Society, which yes. is, is our zoo. You've been on uh, the board of Teammates Mentoring. You've been on uh, a number of. Let's see what I else got here. I wanted to catch uh, Teammates Mentoring. Kiwit Luminary, which I thought, Nebraska Medicine, University of Nebraska Foundation. You've also been on the boards of Commercial Federal Bank, Creighton University, Children's Hospital, the Business Alliance, and Knights of Exarbon. Yes, all at different times. But all yes. at different times. Well, yes. you've had a great career, so lots of Thank opportunities. You. And then you've also been honored by the Omaha Chamber as the um, uh, Commerce, or Omaha Chamber of Commerce as the Woman in Leadership Award, as well as the uh, uh, Business Hall of Fame you've been inducted to for the yes. Omaha uh, Chamber of Commerce. So a uh, very distinguished career. And uh, we're, I want to get it also, of course, the strengths finder, because that's a, a key part of what you do is help organizations looking through their strengths to be able to hire, develop, retain talent and all that sort of thing and be successful. So we'll get to all that as well. But let's start by just talking about, take me through your childhood. Right. Where'd you grow up? Where'd you go to school? What was it like? Um, and then kind of Take us to you know University of Nebraska and how we got here. Right here in Lincoln, Nebraska. Great. Um, born and raised here. It was actually fun as I was just getting ready to park and come into the capital to literally drive down memory lane. And I love to do that any chance I get to come back to Lincoln. So um, I have three siblings and my mom right. and dad. And you work with all of them, right? I work for 50 yeah. years. We've all worked together, which right. means I started as a well, very young in, child. We're going to get into the whole family <laughs> okay, dynamic okay. thing as well, because I've worked with my father and my siblings. Yes. So. <laughs> have, yes exactly. so you understand family businesses very well. Right. Um, so I grew up here. Um, we were very very close to my grandmother. Um, I went to Pirtle Elementary. I went to East High when it was a 7 through 12. Okay, so that's before there was a Southeast and Northeast, is that well, right? Southeast was there and Northeast oh, was there. Okay, so Lincoln. Oh, so this is Lincoln each East. of us okay. siblings went to different schools. Oh. Two of us went to East High. East was okay. relatively new for my sister. By the time I was there, it was, it was, it had been it. around a while, but yes. Okay. Um, and then on to the University of Nebraska Lincoln, where I was actually, um, my degree is in College of Education but the majority of my classes were in the College of Business, which is kind of a fun story um, because at the time I was trying to make the decision, I loved everything teaching and I loved everything business and literally could not decide. And my dad said to me, um, with your love of teaching and your love of business and management, I think you should go into teacher's college. Now okay. remember, this is 40 years ago. Right. And he said, because at this stage of the game, business college doesn't really teach what great managers and leaders are. They teach the competencies. So go get your right. competencies at the College of Business, but get all the stuff about how people learn, how they develop, and um, really the aspects of human development and human nature through Teachers College. So that's now, what I did. Now, was he thinking about, okay, I don't want to jump the gun too much, but was he thinking about the strength finders at that point and how, thinking about how to help businesses through how do people interact and learn? So StrengthsFinder hadn't been developed in 1980 right. at that point, but he always had had, um, his research basis was all around selection and human development. Right. So at that point, yes, he knew that great managers were very different than what so many schools were teaching as it related to management. So he did have a vision and a foresight that then by the end of his life, he said, I really want to make sure that we have a Clifton Strengths Institute at the University of Nebraska at Lincoln so we can truly help those students in business understand what makes great managers and great leaders. And that's why today okay. we have the Clifton Strengths Institute. Cool. So so you graduated. So did you, you went to the teaching college? Yes, I went through teachers. Yes, great. with the majority of my classes in business, graduated um, in 1984 and had the decision of, am I going to teach or am I going to go into business? And my sister at that time was head of HR, and my dad was chairman and CEO. And he said, just stay here. Just yeah. stay here. And so, you know, and I think it's a great thing for parents to think about. 
So often parents just say, oh, you need to go away. And yet as great Nebraskans, I actually am a huge proponent, my daughter and son-in-law and granddaughter live in Kearney, of helping our kids stay here. Yeah. The most successful, the most talented, it's great for them to stay here, as you know. So it was really a way to say, um, stay here, help us run this business. And I didn't, I never looked back. Yeah, no, I think that's a great point just on the ask people to stay here because so we're contemporaries. I mean, I graduated from college in 86, so just a couple years behind you. And I always felt like it was never spoken, but I always kind of felt like people said, well, you kind of got to go, go away to win your fame and fortune. hundred percent. And I got to tell you right now, every time I'm talking to young people, I'm like, hey, we stay here. Or if you do go away, we want you back. Me too. Because, we, and I, I'll tell you, Mike Flood, who's actually our new congressman elect, mm -hmm. uh, or actually got sworn in today, so he's now congressman. Um, he actually recruited one of our Nebraskans who left and went to DC. She was an attorney. And he just, all he did was ask, when are you coming back? And it just planted the scene in her brain to come back, and eventually she so did. So important. But you got to ask. You, you And you got to tell people. I think it's what absolutely. you're saying. Absolutely. Absolutely. You just got to be really straightforward and say, hey, you can make your fame and fortune here. We got a great place in Nebraska. Or if you do go away, come back. We yep. want you here. Absolutely. So that's cool. All right. So you started right off the bat in the family business. I did. Now, so what was your first role? Um, I was actually managing um, our little tiny interviewing center. We were not Gallup okay. at that point. We were selection. Research Incorporated. Okay, out of SRI. Yes, SRI. Yep. We used you at the time, just so you know. Oh, right. Yes, of course you did. Yes. <laughs> and so we were just kind of experimenting and beginning to try our hand at surveys and polling. And um, we were really just getting the whole thing started. So I came in and put a lot of processes and systems in place. And then as the story goes, that was 1984, George Gallup um, came from Princeton, George Gallup Sr., and visited. He was one of our guest speakers in the Cornhusker okay, cool. one time. And he said to his sons, if anything ever happens to me, make sure you go back to that little company in Lincoln, Nebraska, because they understand methodology, but more importantly, they understand what it makes to, to do great interviews and to do cool. great polling that creates yeah. a different level of quality because you can truly elicit the answers out of humans that they want to tell you because they trust you. So then the story goes on that when he did pass away, um, his sons um, worked with Jim Clifton and Jim Krieger to figure out a way that then we could buy it. And yet all the large networks, Rupert Murdoch, this right. is the story, this is the folklore, but I think it's all true, went in to Never say- Never let the truth get in the way of a good story. Well, yeah, exactly. <laughs> that, you know, They were gonna come in and buy it, and this little company in Lincoln actually won out because of our quality, because of our brand, and because of our that standards. That is cool. So we never looked back, that was 1987, and we just had massive growth all through the 90s. That is way cool. So let me ask you, so you were in charge of the interview section, were you able to apply what you learned out of the teaching college to that interview to help develop that methodology? Absolutely. Well, not necessarily in the methodology okay. per se, but really more so in the management as it relates to, you know, teaching, managing, parenting, and Got coaching it. all have so many similarities. Yeah. Just a thin line in terms of some of the little differences between them. Um, so I think it was really more about creating a great management area so that people then could feel like they could truly um, be highly productive, contributing, they could have high quality, they had a mission as to why they were doing the work. You could retain people, right? I mean, even in the 90s, we cared a yeah. lot about retention yeah. as it related to what it meant for a great business. Yeah, okay, that's cool. And were you there then when Gallup became a part of your organization? Yes, and, because yeah. that was 1987. So right. I started in 84, and then by 87, and then we literally- But you were, were still flying. on the interview group, which was one of the reasons why they loved you guys? I'm sure that's, yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> let's, let's go with that one. That's a good, I like, that's good, a good right. story, yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so we used to literally fly to Princeton, boy, almost, if not every week, it was at least a couple times a month because they were learning from us, we were learning from them because it was the old, I mean, it was a small relative at the time, merger and acquisition of those areas to begin to figure out how we could have shared experience and really wrap in the people from Princeton. Um, now, do you still have people Lincoln. in Prison? No, they basically everybody's all got to consolidate your global workers. headquarters, right? So global headquarters went into um, Washington years okay. ago after Princeton. Okay. Um, but the majority of people still reside right here in Nebraska. Okay. Very good. Well, that's exciting. So now tell me about your career path with, um, you know, Gallup. Like what were the kind of the steps of your progression that you made, you know, the different parts of the company you worked in? Because obviously you end up as the COO, Chief Operating Officer, which means you're kind of run all the operations, right? So tell me about that, but also kind of work in the family dynamic. Okay. Like, what did your dad say about it? You know, uh, how was the transition period? You know, it's a family business, still privately held, uh, family-run business. So, and that, which by the way, congratulations. Thank you. Very challenging thing to do. You know, Thank you. In my own personal experience, I know how challenging that is, and I've seen it in other businesses. But tell me about how that 
you know, your current profession, but also how that the fi- family dynamics worked into that. How did your dad play into that? How did your siblings play well, into that? Well, a couple that? things. In the spirit of strengths, he believed in finding what each of us did very well and positioning us accordingly so we would each have our own areas cool. in order to help develop not only ourselves, but the company and all those that would then follow. Um, the other thing is, is ironically, or not ironically, but we're seven, 11, and 14 years apart. Oh, so that's it's significant. A yeah. very different dynamic. It's like you're all middle families. children or something. I don't yes. know. <laughs> or older children or something. I, oldest, youngest, whatever. Right. So between the four of us, we really could each kind of have our own area. Um, my sisters are both PhDs and they took more of a research route. Cool. Um, one really um, in the child care, both in education and in the child care area. I, in the end, ended up gravitating more towards that business aspect. My brother has been um, always hardcore into business development. Mm-hmm, yeah. And so it really kind of became more of a um, complementary relationship between really, the four yeah, really of us like it, yeah. in doing our own things in our own areas and figuring out how we work together to literally grow the business as fast as we could. As you know, you know when, when it first starts out and is smaller, it's much more entrepreneurial. So you don't have a lot of the defined, you know, extreme rules, regulations, right. guidelines. You know, you're kind of making it up as you go. And one of the things I was always fascinated with was studying best practices of larger organizations to begin to figure out how we put some of those strategies, standards, structure in place, um, always starting with a belief or a philosophy rooted in our research, um, Gallup research, SRI research, and then taking it really to the next level of making sure that there is that individual human development along the way. Cool. So talk to me again about kind of the steps in your career path. So Well, again, it morphed. About... It really yeah. morphed because yeah. as um, being the, the owners of the organization, we've always been employee-owned as well. So um, my dad um, died in 2003. Mm-hmm. So he was with us the entire time, you know, over the course of, well, what would have been 30 years for all of us kids. And now the rest of us have gone on the additional 20. Um, so I basically went from the interviewing center, added on some of what we call debt data processing back then, um, the editing, the coding, and each of the different areas that really made up the client service cycle. And then as we went through the client service cycle, that was really a way to make sure that we had each of the different great managers in place. So then each of the different managers would report to me so that we could, you know, have a cohesive group that really created, I think, one of the world's best cultures. So one of the things that we do for clients is help them develop strong cultures. Right. But we have to have our own culture in place first. Right. And um, I'm very proud that we've been able to create a tremendous culture through the decades. So uh, so it sounds like you just you kept the interview part and just kept growing or adding well, on actually, to, to get the whole client. You know, I think <laughs> I, I laugh because my siblings sometimes go, God, you're really good at delegation. I was always, <laughs> Key I, to authority, right? Well, maybe. And I was always <laughs> I was always developing other people. So I to your question, no, I was handing off the interviewing center by okay. the 90s and had um, this wonderful woman who ran it for 30 years. And then she had upwards at some point, I don't know, 30 different managers um, in her team. So over time, we were always morphing and multiplying and maximizing so that other people had opportunities for leadership. Yeah. So you, you mentioned how important it was to be able to create that great culture. How did you do that? Like, I, I would say that a lot of companies probably aren't thoughtful or purposeful about how they create the culture. Sometimes it just happens and it's good. Sometimes it happens and it's bad. How did you all think about creating a corporate culture? Well, it really starts with talent, strengths, mission, purpose, all the basics of what makes a great company. So Mm -hmm. when you're all rallying around a tremendous mission for all the different types of work and industries that Gallup's a part of, and then you're really helping match people to their right fit in terms of what they do best, what they like best, what their competencies are, all the things that give them the opportunity to do what they do best and give them a great manager so that they can excel at that pretty soon people begin to see that it becomes the Gallup way. And then all of a sudden there's repetition, there's consistency. Did you have something written down that said the Gallup way? Yes, yes. For a long time it was called the Gallup way. It's morphed into many different things. But, you know, when we think about our products are the Gallup Q12, which is one of, if not the most Mm -hmm. famous, engagement survey Mm -hmm. anywhere in the world, literally. So if you live by the 12 tenets and the 12 questions, immediately that becomes a set of values. If you live by the values of strengths, immediately that becomes a set of strengths. Um, we also have many leadership and management courses, and each of those have different tenets within them as well. So each of those different things kind of became a prescribed way that people could quickly see how they fit into the organization and what it took for them to succeed and excel. Yeah. Okay, cool. And so is there, is it something that you wrote down and then it morphed over time, or did, was it like yes, the actual I mean, words all, that it stay the same? It's, um, that's a good question. We also had what we called um, activated values. That was kind of a, a pact between a manager and an individual. 
And literally, I wrote it in 1997 and thought, oh, this will go away after this conference. They still use it today to train with. Okay. And it's kind of stood the test of time. Obviously, Strengths is, I mean, Strengths is now at 28 million people around the world. Yeah. It's in, um, I, I've lost track, 180 countries. I mean, it's almost in every country in the world. It's absolutely amazing. And so when you think about each of those things, not only is the research written down, the research is validated, all parts of the science, each of those things have, um, uh, I don't know if taxonomy, that's not quite the right word, but each of them have um, lots of literature on them. And our content is now um, just exploded all over the world. So the content is um, everywhere from our website to each of the different um, customer notifications that get um, push notifications. It's written everywhere. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's the best way to answer it, I guess. Cool. And so when did the Strengths Finder come along? When About 97, 98. 97, he 98. was doing test retest still in 2000. And again, was he, he, he knew he was sick by 02 and then died in 03. So it was really, really new, just as he was literally um, dying, which Didn't is so sad. He didn't get to see. Yeah. And he said, if only someday a million people, or maybe even in a big dream, 15 million. And now, of course, we're at 28. And have yeah. big dreams for a hundred million or a billion. I'd be so proud, right? Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. That's cool. So now talk to me about um, how the strength finders developed. Did you have critics over the time? How did you overcome the critics? Was it something that you you had a big success story early on about how people used it? Talk a little bit about that. Well, the world, as you know, has changed. And actually, maybe for everybody, take a step back and talk about what is it, what is actually I, we're, we're talking okay. about because we know. You're right. But You're right. why don't you talk a little about what is the strengths finder? It's a 180 item questionnaire assessment mm -hmm. that people can take really to discover who they are and what they do best. And um, the the best way to describe it is that it lets people take anywhere from 30 to 45 minutes and literally go through and do paired comparisons and answer a question that describes them best. And part of it is a little bit about you want it to be top of mind and you want it to have a little bit of speed to it so that you're not overthinking it, right. but really saying, this is who I am. And then you get this absolutely incredible report that will either give you just your top five, you can also buy a top 10 or you can buy a 34. And, and how many total are there? Uh, 34. 34, sorry, okay. 34 you get, you strengths. You can get all 34 strengths. Yes, you can okay. get all 34 strengths. And you can also get strengths for managers. Um, soon we'll have strengths for leaders, um, strengths for salespeople. And it's just a wonderful way to really Think about what you do best. We always say... Don't you also have kind of one for entrepreneurs, kind of the growing the company? Yes. Is, um, or is that the manager one? No, that, that's more the manager that's one. That's manager one, okay. So we also say um, never are we so strong as when we have our strengths and successes in mind. And so really the combination of when a person knows what they do well, and it's never a one and done. So kids will get it in college and might look at it and put it on a shelf. Not good enough. You've either got to have a coach, you've got to go back and be able to really think through it, have team discussions, um, events where you can talk through and say, this is who I am, and you need to forgive me when I'm this person. Yeah. Because we all have weaknesses. We all yeah. have basements. It's called balconies and basements. And you know, how do we appreciate, respect, like, and ultimately love people more because we appreciate who they are and all the things they bring to the table that make yeah. them so great. Yeah, including their not only their strengths, but also their faults. Too. Absolutely, yeah. yes. So at the time, I'm going to throw out something. You can tell me if I'm wrong or not. At the time, it seems to me that a lot of things when it came to kind of self-help or organizational help was focused on, hey, here's your problems, here's your weaknesses, and how do we overcome those, mm -hmm. right? How do we, how do you, you know, like you keep track of the things that you need to work on and you work on those things. But Strength Finders really kind of turned that on its head and said, no, no, don't focus on the things that you're not good at. Focus on the things you're good at. And that's how you're going to be successful. Is that a fair statement it's of how you guys change things? It's a things? very fair statement, and it's a very important statement because... Really what it does is it takes us back in time. So my dad was born and raised in Boyd County. And he went. He was a regional Rural County scholar. here in Nebraska, for those of you who yes, don't know. Yes, yep. Northeast Nebraska. Yep. And he went off to World War II and was the, one of the youngest captains at 20 and World War II navigator in the cool. European theater. So he saw navigator a lot of- Navigator on an airplane? Yes. Okay. He's, what kind of plane uh, did he fly? B-24. 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 Yes. Cool. The Liberator. All right. Yeah. Yep. So he saw a lot of um, damage and destruction, right? Yeah. So when he came home, he knew he had to do something good. And um, that intellect of his and that psychology of his and that education and math background was a very unique background where he knew he wanted to do something different. So, so was that a responsibility strength? Um, <laughs> no, well, he has it somewhere, but not in his top yeah. five. Okay. As a matter of fact, if you ask me to memorize his top five, I don't have this on top, uh, top That's of okay. mind. But I was just making a joke. Yeah, I was like, no. <laughs> no. Um, it was probably his belief or significance, one of those. But at the university, he went through and actually began to see 
that the kids who were having more success mentoring and having more success in bringing out the best in others had a different set of strengths or talents. Not that one was better or worse than the other, they were just very different. Yeah. So then he applied it to um, insurance salespeople. And once he applied yeah. it to insurance salespeople, then investments more in the finance world, pretty soon it began to take off. And actually, I think it was Chancellor Hardin said to him at the time, you really should think about becoming an entrepreneur and making this a business. And that's really what then carried it into the selection instrument that then morphed into the strengths assessment as we know it today. Cool, very cool. So can you talk to me about, uh, okay, so that's kind of an overview of the strengths. You, you, you take this test, you get a list of your strengths, and then talk about kind of the next step after you get your top five, say you get the top five strengths. Talk about what's the next step after that. Well, in an ideal world, whether you're in a business, whether you're in a university, you've got a coach. Right. So at the university, for example, they have these wonderful 80 builders that are, I think they're sophomores um, in college that actually work with the freshmen and go through and help them identify what those strengths are and reinforce how that plays out in their schoolwork, their academics, how it plays out in athletics, how it plays out potentially in their events, their clubs, their sororities, their fraternities. And so do those coaches have to go through a class to yes. be able to get training on how to be a coach for yes. the strengths finder? So yeah. we have over 15,000 certified coaches oh, wow. around the world. Um, as a matter of fact, they all came together uh, three weeks ago, virtually. 5,000 of them and or some of their other cohorts came together for a summit um, that's hosted out of Omaha. Cool. And um, they literally, I think it was... Oh, thanks for the economic uh, development. Uh, it was a ton of countries, too. I can't remember. Well, when it was in person pre-COVID, oh, right. we literally had 2,500 from all over the world. That's awesome. So it really is. And we're going to bring yeah. it back. It'll, it'll get back in person yeah. soon. Cool. Yeah. All right. So you've got the coach then yes. that then helps you continue to develop that. If you were going to apply this, say, in a business uh, environment for a, a manager, how would you see that all laying out? Like, what, so like if you've important. got a manager, they've, they've got the coach, they've got their team. How does that all work? Okay. So when the person is first hired, the best thing is to help them know all that they're good at and how that will fit into the organization and why it's important then it's really important for the manager to know it as well. So maybe the hiring person lets them know, the manager reinforces it, and then it's really important that the rest of the team knows so that then the team can also compliment, high five, congratulate right. on all the successes as it plays out in the contributions and the hardcore performance metrics, the soft side of what makes you who you are. And so that's really why so much of it is important in a, um, in a corporate or a, you know whether it's a small business, a mid-sized business or a large business. And I think one of the coolest things we've done in the last five years is we used to only be for really large businesses mm -hmm. because you could make it scalable and bigger and potentially have more impact. But the reality is it was those tiny businesses that had all the opportunity to grow. And we released it to smaller businesses. It feels like five years ago. It's probably been eight. And now small businesses all over the world can really do that with all their teams and begin to think differently and grow their businesses accordingly. And that's why I said the world's changed so much in 20 years because yeah. there used to be naysayers where now it's just a must in every business that if you aren't doing these types of things for your employees relative to their development, their their um, well-being, um, everything that helps them flourish, you really aren't looked upon as a great organization. Mm -hmm. So it's so critical for those who want to run great organizations to be able to have these types of tools in place. Yeah, cool. So... Um, Tell me about a, a success story, because you talked about, hey, you, you, you're creating this culture, you've got all this stuff. Tell me, well, actually, no, before we get to success story, so I'm, I've kind of primed you on one question. I'm going to get to another question okay. first. Does it help or does it matter to have a team with a lot of different uh, of the strengths being represented in your top five? You know, so for example, is it a plus I've or minus both. to have lots of achievers? I've seen both. <laughs> okay. Um, the CHRO and I were just talking about this, actually. So I'm in transition right now. I'm done with my full-time job, but I'm still transitioning where I'm, I'm helping my old team members. And we were just talking about sometimes if you get too much of a good thing, it can be too much of a good thing. On the other hand, if you're missing something and you can see it in the performance, then you've got to make a change. So I've seen both work where you can have a lot of achievers as long as there's other things underneath right. it working in concert or orchestration with it. Um, so it's really... Uh, and then there's other teams that get pieces missing and you've just got to go in and fill those gaps. Yeah. Okay. So you can have a team with it's heavy on achiever, for example, but as long as they've got other strengths too, you yeah. can just, and it's only if like, if you see something, there's a gap in performance. It right? all comes back to the leader and the manager, right? Yeah. I mean, because they have to set the expectations and really figure out how to work with those complementary strengths and weaknesses. Right. 
Right. And then it also helps raise people's awareness of yes. how I operate, right? 100%. So that we're maybe a little bit more graceful with people if you know what they're, how they're operating. Like that's just, again, you mentioned that earlier, like forgive me when I'm like this. Yes, <laughs> this yes. Is what I'm like. I'll try yes. And, you know, that kind of stuff. That's a good way to say it. All right. So now get, uh, tell me about like a company or an organization that brought the strength finder in, what were they trying to accomplish? And, you know, looking for a success story about how they either turned something around or pro projected themselves to higher performance and how they used well, the strength really finder. Well, there's really two doing. things. So there are the, the midsize and large companies who are doing it where it's within more so really pods within their organization. There are very few organizations who have used it across their entire organization. Mm -hmm. We really took more of a route of grassroots so that people were using it in teams or lines or regions based on the proximity within yeah. the organization. Um, the smaller and midsize might put it in throughout the entire organization. But again, it's with the idea of the more you create a strengths language, the more you begin to have a common understanding of how that plays out with your values, how it plays out with your mission, what, how you can use it to talk differently about your customer base, how you can use it to talk differently about goal setting, all those kinds of things play into it. So it's got a lot of different tentacles within an organization, but it really becomes a common language and common understanding that helps everybody rally together mm -hmm. for a common purpose. Yeah. So was there an example though, like within one of these pods or whatever, where they brought in the strengths finders and here's what they use, what, here's the problem they use to address that allowed them oh, to yes. do better. Uh, Can you give me an example? Mm, I'm, obviously, you don't I'm have to drawing share a any, blank on that one, but You don't yes. have to share any company names or anything like that. Or if there's a small business, it's kind of the same thing where they just said, hey, here's our issue with regard to, maybe it's even just handling the growth and you here's know, how the strength finder really helped them put together the team. I think, uh, I, I can't get you an exact one, but the one that, the, the most general one that comes to mind for me is that it really begins to create this different level of what I would, what I want to call just retention and or the team bonding because there's an appreciation and people become more transparent, they become more authentic, which then lends itself towards the trust that is really the core tenet of all great cultures. When so there do you is see that less attrition at these, yes, less that, at these yes, com companies? Yes. Yeah. So all of a sudden it begins to reduce their turnover and they can have more traction relative to what their clients want. Because the first thing that drives clients nuts right. is when there's too much turnover, right? right? And or you can't get the growth you need, the traction you need, if that occurs. So strengths really allows people to come together in unity and determine what those goals and metrics are that you have to do in order for a company to succeed. Yeah, okay, cool. All right, I'm gonna switch gears on okay. you a little bit here. Let's go to the family business side. Okay. So what was it like working with your father? Um, it was tremendous. I mean, he raised us all to have a pretty extreme work ethic. So one of the things I always say to parents is, make sure you start your kids at a very young age. You'll like this story. He literally would take us out, I want to laugh as I say this, to rest areas across Nebraska. And we would do surveys. This was before we even had like a formal survey business. Right. He would do research at the rest areas. We'd have to um, schlep together hot dogs, lemonade, and we'd stop people at all the rest areas up and down I-80 and start asking them questions. Then he also worked with a guy named Bob Manley, okay. who, you know, beautiful, he did a lot of renditions on beautiful oh, Nebraska. Okay, yeah, yeah, right. And we'd have to go out and sell his CD tapes across the state of Nebraska. And it was back in the days of, well, it would have been late 60s, early 70s, where you'd plug the cassettes in and then you could drive around and go, oh, that's, um, uh, that's the Platte River. Oh, that's Niobrara. Oh, that's Ponca. You know, where you begin to learn more about each of the different, <laughs> whether it was a state park, whether it was um, a monument, a landmark. And so he would teach us young how to be entrepreneurs on things like that. But he always wanted us working. I had a paper route by the time I was 11 or 12. I did too. I was a paper route. Yeah, paper boy. World, yeah. Uh, world yeah. Herald, I assume. Yep, absolutely. You were <laughs> a journal star? Uh, no, just World Herald. Oh, World Herald. Oh, in okay. Lincoln, though. In I was Lincoln, schlepping okay. World Heralds in Lincoln, yes. Okay. And then, um, you know, even my grandma, his mom, worked all of her life, which would have been very rare. By the way, I have to get this in. I'm a fifth generation Nebraskan, and I say I really should be a seventh because my grandmas were very old. So, my grandma had my mom at 40. My mom had me at 40. So the reality is my ancestors were here before the state was a state. I had to say that. That's cool. So my grandma was really a working woman for a long time. She was um, widowed pretty young. And so she always was talking to us about business and what we could do in terms of what it took to, you know, whether it was cook and clean to run a business or how to, um, yeah, just work. So one day I'll never forget, I was, she was going to babysit me. And my dad was leaving and she goes, Don, you better leave right now because you've got a lot of mouths to feed. But it was a statement that stuck with me forever. Yeah. And at that point, he probably had 10 mouths to feed. Wow, yeah. 
So when I would drive down um, Cumming mm-hmm. Street in Omaha, I think we've got thousands of mouths to yeah. feed. You know, it's a, it's a yeah. really important thing to make sure you wake up every day thinking about what that's going to take. Yeah. So, so, great. so um, now did your dad get involved? Per- like, did your dad ever manage you directly? Did he get involved personally no, with your coaching? No, but it was a small enough, yes, on the coaching. It was a small enough company at the time that he was very present as a leader for all of us. And as a dad, he was still a dad. Right. And so, yes, I mean, he would coach me on things like, you know. I mean, there so did you call him at work? Did you call him dad or Don? I alternated. I did both. Did you really? Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. yeah. How about you? What'd you do? I was always dad. Oh, yeah. Damn. Okay. Yeah, I did both. Uh-huh. And, um, and so, so, but he, but he would take you aside and coach you and, yeah, and that sort of thing. Yeah. Uh-huh. Cool. You know, he, again, he's, he's a po- positive psychologist. Right. So it was more so in the strengths arena, but there were definitely times when he would be very firm, like, you know, why did that happen? We can't do that. Yeah. You know, that kind of stuff. So, and, and you live and you learn from all that. Yeah. Now, what about your siblings and the interaction there? You said a couple, they, everybody had kind of their own area. You know, uh, your sisters were more in the research. Jim was more in like the selling, right? And promoting the company business development. So you all had kind of your own areas, but did you have regular family meetings to talk about the business where the four of you got together or the five of you with your dad, or was it more informal around the dinner table? Like how did that all work? It morphed and changed over the years. So, um, you know, as dad got older, we would have periodic meetings more so about his visions and his wishes relative to um, what he wanted the foundation to become and the Institute. But we were all on the board. Well, my sister Mary came into the board a little bit later, but the three of us, well, the first two were on for a long time. Mm-hmm. I came in in the 90s, and then we've really all been on the board the last five or, I don't know, five or 10 years together. So we've we've had a way that we, you know, work with each other respectfully. Yeah. So, but you all have managed to have a great success pulling all the siblings in. And, you know, your your father obviously set up an organization to be able to do truly that. knew, you know... <laughs> The, the very most important question to really start out the success on a Q12 is, I know what's expected of me. Yeah. And I think he set those expectations so clear when we were young and entered the company that we literally were able to each take those expectations and run with them um, because of the way he had raised us and the expectations he had set for each of us. So, you know, with Connie and Mary between, you know, the um, chief human resource officer and all the educational work and all the research work, they knew exactly what they wanted to mm-hmm. do and needed to do relative to growing those areas. And then Jim, just by the very nature of chairman and CEO, knew what he wanted to do relative to the area. And then because I was um, president and COO, I knew what it took to run, right. literally keep the company running per se from a profit loss standpoint right. um, and make sure that we were healthy and growing. And as or more importantly, that we had this super strong culture that people wanted to join, that we had a strong employment brand in addition to a very, very strong all company brand that has stood the test of time since 1935. Mm-hmm. And so, so you had the family members, you had the non-family members as family members. Did, you know, did you guys talk about business at home on the holidays the time. and stuff like that all, all the, time? the time? As a matter of <laughs> fact, I remember when we were all in Lincoln together and that was really until about 02, 2000 or, or 2002, my mom had us all over every Sunday and we talked about business nonstop. Nothing was literally off the table. Yeah. She would cook and we would take all the grandkids and everybody would just hang out and talk. And I think that that's what kept us together. Um, and then the two oldest siblings moved to D.C. Um, when uh, headquarters became Washington right. in about 2000. And then um, my sister and I, who were in Lincoln, um, she stayed with her primary residence in Lincoln. And then Ed and I moved to Omaha and we moved 500 of our closest friends to Omaha. There you go. So it was 40 years in. And what year was Lincoln. that when you moved to Omaha? Um, 2002 and three. 2002 so the building and was finished or being worked on in 02. We moved. And then 03, everybody moved up. By the way, great improvement on that river line oh, right there. You remember I was what just it, there it was this before? Morning. It was terrible. You remember yes. that with all the tanks, the storage yes, tanks, and everything horrible. like that? Oh, it was horrible. Yeah. The scrapyard. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, you guys made a huge improvement on that. Yeah, it's beautiful. So, thanks. Uh, okay, so now getting back to the family, let's talk about the next generation. What advice would you give other families who are going through that transition from one generation to the next generation. What do you? Th- what did you find the with some of the, the most better. things? Yeah. I mean, I do think we all think we're invincible at some stage. Um, and I think that we oh, have to continue. Nobody wants to grasp with their own mortality, right? Right, that one. Damn. And I think people have to continue to really think about um, what does it mean for the opportunity 
from a financial, a wealth standpoint, but also from a development and a leadership standpoint yeah. for, and I don't mean just family members, I mean for all those thousand plus who are relying on that you. are ready for the next jump too in yeah. their own leadership, that you've got to start letting go at different stages so that you can really let the next group step up and flourish. And I think that that was maybe one of the most difficult things for me personally, because I knew that that's what I'd wanted to do. So for 25 or 30 years, I knew I was raising the next generation above and beyond um, the family. There really it had to be an entire organization now, did that your was dad, being raised. Did your dad teach you that that's what you had to do or just no. through the organization business? And of course, that's I, what you do. That's what you all focus on. You just knew that's what I have to do. Yeah, yeah. Because I will say like just with our family business, um, one of the things I really appreciate about my dad, you know, is with many entrepreneurs, it's hard to let go. Yes. But he brought in an outside CEO. When that person wasn't successful, he didn't go away from the idea. He brought in somebody else who ended up being Joe Moglia, who I think you probably know, who was tremendously successful. And then, you know, dad was chairman of the board and then stepped down to be board member and then eventually stepped off the board. So he, you know, took steps to, to let go of the company. But I know it was very hard for him to do that. So I, I, it sounds like- I think it's really difficult yeah, for most yeah. humans to do. And so I think that there, the more you can put a process in place, the more you can talk about it in advance and the more you can have a system for it and governance, right? Yeah. I mean, so the more governance there is, the better it is to really prescribing what's going to occur and let the process take its course. So that's an interesting question because talking about process, when you joined the company back in 1987- 84. 84, sorry, 84, 87, okay, right, sorry, 84. Did you have a board of directors at that time? We and did. And did you join the board right away? No. Um, I think I was 1990-ish. I need to go back and look at the records. I, I okay, so you, but you got the point is you got some experience before yes. they asked you on the board. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And so that was part of the process is that, hey, new family members. Demonstrated performance, right. demonstrated leadership, um, you know, take time to really show what, yeah, you're bringing to the table, right? Because not everybody chooses it. And I think right. back to the strengths theory, it's really important as parents whether we're in a family owned business or not, that we're truly helping kids see what they do best and what their natural interests are and who they are. Again, kind of like the university thing, I think sometimes parents just assume everybody's gonna do the same job. And that's not how the world works. We need one of everything. Right. <laughs> and we need millions of everything. And so how do you keep helping your kids think above and beyond any one prescribed, oh, it's just what our family's done, whether it's our own business or whether it's that you know, everybody's a plumber in this family, everybody is a construction manager in this family, a real estate, an attorney, whatever. How do you keep helping kids think about what they do best? Yeah, it's kind of funny you say that because my dad, my grandfather was a carpenter and contractor, so he built homes and that sort of thing. And I remember an early conversation with my dad where he said, Peter, I would love for you to come into the family business. This was, you know, was at that time, first national brokerage. But my father wanted me to become a carpenter and I ruined every piece of wood I ever touched. Oh. <laughs> so he's like, yeah. if you want to come back to the family business, we'd love to have you here. If you don't want to do that, I totally understand. <laughs> That's perfect. That's exactly how it yeah. should be. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So now, have you done the Strength Finders with like your kid and the grandkids? Are you oh, guys yeah. rolling well, that Well, she's through? only two. So our, my okay, granddaughter has- Okay, your grandkids yeah, a little yes. bit too young. Yeah, yeah. Um, and between my son-in-law, my daughter, uh, my husband, but yes, each of us as family units. The one thing we never got to that I wish we would have is there are families who will do it as a family, like as a retreat. Oh, and that's a cool idea. It's a really cool idea. So like on a big vacation or something, we oh, did it lightly, but we yeah. didn't do it as formal because it's such second nature to us. So in one sense, it's like we right. all already kind of know. know. Right. Yeah. So it's, it, it's so a if you were going to do that with, okay, so not your family because you're kind of special, but if it was another family, would yes. they then hire a coach to go through yes. that with them then yeah. and bring them yeah. in? Yeah. Okay, and we've had a few cool. That do that. And of course, um, you know, generationally, it's really cool too for people to see what things have carried on generation to generation, what things are a little bit different, and to really talk about how that plays out. Cool. All right. So now let's talk about your strengths and kind of your top five strengths and how that played into your success in becoming, you know, the president and COO. So it's funny because when dad first developed it, um, he did a test retest a couple years later. And I remember taking the test retest and all of a sudden this thing showed up as number one and it was called self-assurance. And I literally was in the building at 68th and O in Lincoln and I looked down and I went, I don't have this, what's this? <laughs> not me, I do not feel Dad, strong. your test is broke. <laughs> I ran, I literally ran across the street and I said, this is not me, what is this? Because you're supposed to. He wanted everybody's opinions on, you know, if they thought it was them or not. And I said, this isn't me. And he goes, um, how did he ask me? He said, do you know what you do well? I said, yeah. He goes, do you know what you don't do well? Do you know what your weaknesses are? He said, yeah. 
He goes, can you let other people be better than you? I said, yeah. Um, he goes, that is self-assurance. He said, self-assurance is not an ego. Self-assurance is not significance. It's being comfortable in your own skin and accepting who you are and being able to own the decisions in life that you make. Yeah. So I went, oh, okay, that is me. But I've had to always <laughs> lean into that one a little bit because it doesn't mean you don't have insecurities. You do because right. you know your weaknesses. Um, but it's the bottom in our database of 34 because so few people really know themselves as it relates to strengths and weaknesses, which is a huge opportunity globally. Yeah. Then number two, I have individualization, which means I key in to really think about who each person is and what they need. So that's I, key for a manager, right? Yeah. I, I mean, you don't have to, you can get by with some other tools, but individualization helps in a lot of ways that or relator or woo or something that shows the warmth towards other people. Then I have belief, which is, I say my balcony in my basement because it means that it comes across pretty strong at times. I'm open and accepting of all. I think I'm very, very inclusive of all. Um, and yet I have strong standards mm -hmm. and I believe in hardcore mission, research, right? facts, mission. So yeah, it can be kind of strong. And then focus means that I always know what I and we want for others in terms of a North star, a compass, a direction. And then last but not least is maximizer. And some people tell me to turn my maximizer off. Because it's, <laughs> how can we be better? What else can we do? We need more of this. So. All right, cool. Well, you know, actually, we did use the Gallup Strength Finder yes. and brought in a coach when I put together my executive team yes. you know, now seven and a half years ago. So, uh, and frankly, one of the big benefits there was just what we've talked about with regard to having everybody have an appreciation or understanding what other people's strengths were so they would know that when we're all interacting together. It's, it's so, what it's all about yeah. right there. Yeah, cool. All right, so uh, is there anything that we have not talked about that you would like to talk about? Um, the only thing I would add in is I, you started to talk about the riverfront and I was at the Luminarium oh, yeah, yeah. this morning. Oh, we want to get to Luminarium. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You want to go there? Yeah, totally. Let's go there. Okay. I, I forgot. That was one of my so, things I wanted to hit upon. Um, it was the first time we had a tour and it will actually open for okay, their administration. Take a step back oh, and yeah. tell us what it is. Okay. So it's the Kiewit Luminarium, which is a science and discovery center. It's actually patterned after the Exploratorium in San Francisco. Right. And you actually hired the person from there, right? Yes. Yeah. Yes, we did. Yes. And she's absolutely wonderful. The executive director and she's already started to hire her staff. I think she's up to about 10 people now. Cool. Um, and so it's, um, the board was all there this morning and we were sitting on the Missouri, just a couple doors down from Gallup and learning all about the exhibits that are coming in. It is going to be one of the most fantastic attractions for the state of Nebraska. Oh, cool. And those I love people, the, and those governor, people I love across the river can come over too, yeah. but um, it is just So amazing. describe a little about what, it, what it's gonna be about. So it's a place <clears throat> where kids can really mm -hmm. explore. One of, the ex, uh, one of the areas is called Dig Deeper, and it's about learning about, for example, construction and dirt and the soil that the land's on. Another one is about discovering self, really understanding the physical components of self as it relates to medicine and health. And then the other part is the psychology of self. So it's every form of science. It's just super cool. So it's been fun to be on that board to see it from inception, to hire the executive director. We took a trip to Exploratorium. Um, and it will open spring of 23. Cool. Now, it's also very hands-on, right? This is a lot very, of people, yes. like, like young yes. people getting a chance to actually put their hands or... You know, it's I'm, perfect yeah. for little kids, um, high school kids, and for parents and grandparents to really see kids in action. So it'd be um, the next, I want to say, that, uh, kind of the next step up or different from a children's museum. It's right. much more um, kind of the next level of kids' thought process in terms of how they see everything STEM. Um, so it's it's going to have lots of different moving um, exhibits as well. So some will be, um, uh, I don't know how fast they turn over, but they'll bring in different rotating exhibits over so time. So they'll, they'll always, well, likely be something fresh for people to see if they keep coming back. Yes. Yeah. Yes, exactly. And then the building itself is beautiful too, right? Stunning. You want to try and the Kiewit talk a little Corporation, about that? the Peter Kiewit Foundation, and several donors um, really made a commitment to the riverfront and made it just outstanding. But the Kiwit Corporation... So talk a little bit about what it looks like. Uh, it's this stunning, modern, um, white, silver, glass... Um, so lots square, of natural light? Lots of natural light, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's just beautiful. Cool. Like not, There aren't many buildings that look like it anywhere in Nebraska. It's, it's gorgeous. Okay, cool. Well... Thank you. Got you. I'm glad we got that one. And yes. thanks for reminding me about yes. that because I was I wanted to hit upon that because that's kind of a big deal. All right. Anything else that we haven't hit upon that we need to? I'm just going to say real quick that I think 
the community aspect of Nebraska is one of the most important things that truly makes this the good life. So whether it's Lincoln, whether it's Omaha, but Omaha's philanthropic community is absolutely amazing. And it's been a huge honor and I'm so proud to be a part of it. Um, so that would be... Well, okay, so let's talk about that because one of the things that you've been an advocate for is not just developing great organizations, but developing great organizations because it impacts the community. Yes. Why don't you talk a little bit about that? Because you've also been, obviously, we listed your bio earlier, you've been involved in a lot of the different community organizations over the years. Talk about how you think about that and how you see that. So back on my dad, that was one of the most important things he really um, um, expected is he said... It's important that you give back to the community and find those really pillars of success. So find the organizations that are already doing a lot of good for children, for diversity, for education, and that are really strengths and leadership based to help kids think about the future. So one of the last or first that he said was, you know, the zoo's the um, state's largest tourist attraction, right. get involved with the zoo. So we started giving money to the zoo from Gallup and obviously Ed and I do too as well. And I'm on the board. Um, we're right in the middle of, um, uh, getting ready to hire a new CEO in the next few months. Um, and, you know, it's just been this tremendous, um, wonderful asset to our state. So that's been very exciting. Um, cool. Peter Kewitt Foundation, it's a huge honor to be a part of that. And again, you know, dad saying, and I think Omaha's also just been wonderful about saying, hey, as a leader of, a, of an organization, you really need to step up and give back to the community. But that matched my values or my belief perfectly mm -hmm. because my dad had said the same thing. So, yeah. You know, I was able, because of the great people we have at Gallup, to really spend time outside in the community so much um, because everything has been, you know, running so well. Cool. So now let me ask you a question because you've been on a number of boards we were just talking about. Do you interview them? Uh, now, obviously, you chose the zoo for a reason. But when I'm sure you That's get funny. asked, I'm sure you get asked by a lot of organizations yes. to participate on their boards. Uh, do you interview them or well, how do you okay. decide which, uh, like do you interview them and say, Hey, are you, you know, like, that's an excellent yeah. question. And formally I wish, but not technically <laughs> the kind of, so when right. we first moved to Omaha from Lincoln, um, I think we had 40 different organizations either ask for somebody to be on the board or for money. So we had 40 to, people asked you, for not joking. Oh, yes. No kidding. Wow. So we had to start narrowing very right. fast. Yeah, yeah. And back then the world's changed. I, I said this before, but as it relates to women in executive positions, it's changed a ton. So I was, one of the only that they kind of could see. There were a ton there, but yeah. they just didn't necessarily see them. So they were like, oh, you know, we got to gotta grab a well, woman. Well, Gallup's a pretty high profile and, company and just in general. Yeah, yeah, all that. So um, <clears throat> really, I delegated again where I'm like, okay, you take this board, you take this board, based on their interests, individualization, to say who would most like the sports commission, who would most like the chamber. Um, and it was, it was really a cool experience. And we've continued to do that through the years. So as I did that, and as I was asked, I would look at where the mission match was for Gallup and or the mission match for me. So some are personal, right. some are Gallup, and then I could kind of begin to determine which ones were right based on their stature, their brand, and most importantly, really their giving and phil philanthropic philosophy. Yeah, okay, cool. All right, so I've got a daughter who's 23, another one who's 21. If you were gonna give advice to young women coming into the workforce or completing their post-secondary education, what advice would you give them? Oh boy, that's hard. Um, Figure out why you want to work and where you want to work. Um, and then find a place that allows you really to have the level of flexibility you want in addition to the purpose and the mission and the ability to use your strengths. Now, that's a mouthful, but I mean every bit of it. So in other words, women, especially today, can be more choosy than they've ever been, more picky. And companies have gotten so much better because it is an employee-driven market. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so absolutely. they can ask for it. Um, I was speaking with a woman last week at the Riverfront um, event party. Um, and she was saying about how important it is for young women to work as long as they possibly can. I mean, there are times when childcare becomes too difficult. God forbid if they lose a husband for whatever reason, they need to continue to work. So mm -hmm. I would say find a job where you can work and if you choose to have children, be able to raise your children because right. when you can do both, it's just the best thing in the world. You know, find a great daycare, find a great in-home care when you start having kids so that you can continue to either have a part-time schedule, a full-time schedule. And for the women who choose the Uber schedules, the 50, 60 hour week, go for it. If that's who you are, if it's not who you are, find the kind of company that will allow you to do the 30 or the 40 yeah. hour week. So you've really got to look at small, small to mid-sized companies, mid-sized to large or the really large companies and look at how some of those differences, the pros and the cons, play out in their benefits, ranging from everything 
maternity and paternity, all the way through to payroll, to the expectations of flexible and remote. So yeah. that was a lot. But no, no, I think it's good. I and mean, actually, one of the things, and let me ask you if you see this as a trend in businesses, is allowing people, whether you're a man or a woman, to bring your kids to work. You know, not necessarily on a, like, I'm bringing them five days a week, but, you know, just like, hey, I'm going to give my wife a break today, so I'm going to bring, you know, my two well, yes school-age no. kids in during the summer. So my two sisters, again, are child psychologists, and they taught me at a very young age that that's actually, and this is maybe kind of radical, not a healthy thing. So really? to bring them in the morning, you know, like for the first yeah. hour, seven to eight, Andrew and I were talking about that on the way up, great. Or to bring them in your last hour, like let's say you've got a report you've got to finish and you just can't, you know, get out by five, so you're going to bring them from 4.30 to 5.30, great. Um, maybe for a day for two or three hours because the daycare's sick. Right. But other than that, it's not fair to the child. Mm-hmm. So Because they need to go out and play. They need to yeah. play and they yeah. need your 100% undivided attention or they need a place where they can go play. So too often people will you know, go, oh, I have my baby in the crib. Yeah. It's like, that's not cool for the baby. Yeah. You might think it's cool for you in your work environment. It's not okay for the baby. Yeah. Okay. Well, so. good advice. No, I appreciate that. That's good. <laughs> well, it's interesting because, you know, you think about it for thousands of years of human evolution, kids actually did go to work with the parents because that's what on you had to farm, do. On the farm, yes. Yeah, on the farm, I know, yeah, I exactly. About that. Yes, yes. <laughs> and then they were working, right? right? But they were working, right? Well, and I started work at seven. So if you can start to give kids assignments Something at a to young do, age, right. then it's really important. But when they're little tiny babies up till five or six, and they don't, they can't, you know, color or read or be independent, then it's a little bit different. So it also depends on the age, it depends on the business, all those things. But you really got to think about the child first. Okay, I got one more thing. Okay. I, mean, I, I probably say that won't come up with another one because every time you say something, it makes me think of something <laughs> else. So obviously with the pandemic, we went, you know, the entire world has gone through a change. Whether it goes back to a lot of people in the office or what I see, again, with my children and other people, that this whole work remotely has become a part of what we're doing now. So people are coming in three days a week, taking two days a week where they're working from home. Does what you do with StrengthsFinder impact that? Or have you thought about how, what's going to, does this make it different? Does it not matter? I mean, is there anything you see with kind of this change in how we might be working and whether or not it's going to be permanent? We haven't gone into any in-depth research as it relates to strength. So let me just put this over here on the table. We've done massive research on everything hybrid, remote, and in the office. And of course, there's a huge difference between, I mean, the businesses like, um, you know, hospitals or, or some universities or yeah, manufacturing, some they have to, yeah, they've got to yeah. be in person. Yeah. But in the places where you can work remotely, it really comes down to the manager, the actual task or job at hand and the team. And if the manager's not handling it right in terms of the team and the outcomes for the customers and the business, it's an epic fail. So it's really got to be coordinated and orchestrated appropriately because some people want to be hybrid. Some people are only remote and will only look for jobs that are remote moving right. forward. But that doesn't mean a business has to say everybody has to be remote. You've got to, you know, play, you got to mitigate your risk on how many people you're going to lose or gain in the hiring game. And then you have to say that there are some jobs that have to be in person five days a week. So it's really kind of setting again the right expectations, the right standards to say these 20 jobs are in person every day. These 20 jobs can be hybrid, but then we expect you in two to three days a week. And these few jobs can be 100% remote but then we want you in, you know, once a month for a meeting or something. So will so, it take better managers then to, rem- to manage all this? Uh, probably look at that. And we're wrapping up on a, yeah. a it's another the manager. pitch for why you need to have <laughs> yeah. Gallup Strengths yes. Fighters. <laughs> it's the manager for sure. I yeah. could be selling your company. That's there. right. Oh, you're very good at it. You're very good. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Well, we're going to go ahead. And, I realize now we have run longer than we usually okay. do. But I'm going to go ahead and wrap up. Now, you're retiring. So yes. usually I ask people, you know, is there any way, how do people follow you on social media or is there, but maybe you don't want to be followed on social media as you retire. Is there any way well, that I'm people, funny about social is there anything media. you want to promote? Well, yes. Gallup.com is absolutely tremendous and we've never been better with our content. And it ranges obviously from um, everything um, really with world news and, and world affairs all the way through to everything workplace, remote, hybrid, great managers and what you need really to um, uh, excel at work. So it's got, um, quite a bit of variety in what we do and it's never been more noticed in the media than right now. So it's cool. just absolutely tremendous. But www.gallup.com obviously. And then there's a whole bunch of other sites off of that as well. And if you want to know more about StrengthsFinder, you can go there and also find StrengthsFinder. 
Cool. All yeah. right. Very cool. All right. And for me, you can uh, follow me on Facebook, on Instagram. It's at Gov Ricketts at Twitter. You can always mail, email me at pete.ricketts at nebraska.gov. So please go on to the social media platforms. Give us a five-star ranking. It always helps. We always appreciate that. See, I'm not, I'm shameless. <laughs> <laughs> But Jane, thank you so much for joining us for another edition of the Nebraska Way. I really appreciate you having on. It's been great. And I look forward to seeing the future of Gallup as you turn it over to the next generation. Sounds great. Thank you. Great. Thanks. Paid for by Pete Ricketts for Governor, 1610 N Street, Suite 100, Lincoln, Nebraska, 68508.